our time because we have so much to cover. And um, this is one of the highest um, registrations I think we have ever had. Um, so hopefully we'll have great uh, show rate because I honestly think that we maximized our registrations for this topic. So um, I'm Sarah Jones. I'm the CEO of PMD Alliance, and I'm joined with a whole team because we know we have so many people here. So you can see Becky, um, and Becky's here. She's going to help make sure that people get in and that we kind of watch that. You've got Rebecca helping on that back end too, and um, Anissa. Anissa is going to co-host with me. Do you want to say a few words, Anissa? Hello, everybody. So I appreciate all of your patience that of you that came on last week um, with the great anticipation and then Dr. Torajagi had a power failure where he was. Um, so thank you so much for coming back to us. We were just getting started and some really great information. And I know a few of you had chatted some questions and I want you to know that I went through the chat and I pulled out those questions, so I saved them. So we will go to those questions when we get the opportunity. Of course, feel free to chat those questions or additional questions as we get started today, but just know that um, I did collect those so we can answer them for you. And I'm so glad to see so many people. It is such an important topic and I'm very excited that we're gonna really delve into this with him. So thank you for coming back. And, and if you weren't on last week and you're just now joining, you're in for a treat. Exactly. And this is part of a series. So we started it a couple of weeks ago with uh, Dr. Torres Yagi. And, and it's designed to be a series of four. You can attend just one. And if you missed the last one or the first one, um, you can always go back and rewatch it. This series, this entire series will be and is being recorded and put on our YouTube channel. So you will always be able to access it. But it's part of a four part series that's going to build on itself. So we started with how do you even track your medication. And there's some great medication trackers out there. Lots and lots of them, actually. And your doctor may have even given you one. There's one in the Aware and Pick Care Kit. There's a bunch of different ones. But one of the reasons that we decided to kind of show you a different tool for that is that in conversation with Dr. Torres Yagi, there's there's a really, it's pretty rare to have a medication tracker that tracks all of the information that you might need should you be in an emergency. And so you might, and really specific information to make sure that the doctor that's treating you knows exactly what you're trying to, what you usually take. So that's what that initial one was for. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about how the brain progresses with PD and cognitive changes, because another conversation that we've been having is, it's really hard to explain it. It's one thing to kind of go, I don't know, it's hard to, I don't remember as well, or he doesn't remember as much as easily, or you know, my thinking feels a little slower. And those are okay conversations, but how can we get more refined with our words so that the doctor can more effectively treat um, the changes and understanding what happens in the brain as PD progresses. That's today's topic. The next topic, which is coming up in two weeks, I think, I I lost track. I think it's two weeks from um, today, I think. Um, that topic is going to focus on something called polypharmacy. So we've talked many times about how people with Parkinson's rarely take one medication. A lot of times you might start with carbidopa, levodopa, but a lot of times other medications are added and there's a real different reason for that. So while it can feel like, boy, I'm taking yet another medication, understanding how those go together and how that mix, it's really it's a science and an art. Um, and the polypharmacy talk, I think is, I'm making up the date. I want to say it's around the 18th. We'll definitely connect, confirm that for you before we hang up so that you have that. And then the last one, Dr. Torres Yagi will be joining with one of his colleagues, Dr. Miri, who developed an amazing tool that's online um, that can also be accessed on your phone. Um, and, you know, should you run to the emergency room and leave your wear and care kit at home, or, you know, your adult child wants to be able to access information for you um, and help because they were called by chance because you went to the emergency room or something. Um, this tool is amazing um, and it's really designed, it's designed by a doctor, um, thinking about how doctors communicate so that it, it's just a really cool tool. So it's a four part series. We are incredibly grateful for the time he is giving us for this, for the, you know, he donates his time to us for this and we are, we are in 
incredibly grateful um, for that. So that is what the whole series um, is about. Um, and again, we'll make sure that you um, that you um, are able to know when the next one uh, is. And I think I better not talk any further because we've got Dr. Torres Yagi ready to go. So um, he's not on my front screen right now. Oh, let me tell you two quick things. One is um, we really wanted to open it up for question and answer, but because we have so many people, we yeah. want to get through as many questions as possible. So Anissa is going to kind of track those and help us guide those. Just go ahead and put them in the chat at any time, um, and we'll keep track of that. Um, and the chat button, if you're not used to it, is in the bottom middle. So, um, okay, I am not going to have you wait another minute. It is my true pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Torres Yagi. He is a gem and a treasure to work with and partner with for PMD Alliance um, and anybody that gets the opportunity. He runs the, um, the uh, Cognitive and Dementia Center at George. Town University. He is, you know, an expert in this area and it's what he does. He looks at cognition. So it is going to be an absolute treat to be able to hear from him. Dr. Torres Yagi, I am going to turn it over to you and close my mouth for a minute. Oh, no, that's so nice. At least, you know, I, um, I'm usually, um, I, I'm usually about two minutes late. So Sarah knows me now. Um, I always run a little bit behind. Sometimes my patients say, okay, I think we, we spent enough time together. Let's get out of here. I say, okay, good. At least that, as long as you feel like your questions have been answered, I feel happy. But that's what keeps me late all the time. It's and good because we got to give the overview of the whole series. So it's perfect. Perfect. Okay. I, I love it. Okay. So I'm so happy. I think um, uh, being able to connect with so many people just from my clinic, this is my clinic room. Um, makes me really, really happy. Um, it ha happy from my end to be able to tell you about some things that you guys hopefully really want to hear about. So um, I, I left you hanging last time. We had like almost like I, I think there must have been a tornado somewhere outside. We even lost cell service. So I even I I drove I drove right home because I said, oh my goodness, our infrastructure has been you know attacked or something. I said this. Who loses cell service? But um, anyway, I'm sorry to have left you hanging. Um, I, I do want to um, go through a little bit some pictures, um, some slides as well that I put together um, so that we have some um, something to talk about, um, about how it is that our, our condition can progress over time. And thinking about this, um, not only as a motor disorder, but also a non-motor disorder. Now, I want everyone to promise um, that at the end of this, everyone's going to feel very hopeful because the way we set the series up was first to think about the medication list, as Sarah mentioned, then to talk kind of about what can go wrong. So understanding how the condition progresses helps us understand about what can go wrong, right? But the next uh, presentation is going to be about what we can do to make the things that went wrong go right. Right, so this is kind of um, how it is that we can think about our disorder as in a in a motor and non-motor non-motor way. Have has everyone heard the term non-motor before? Good, good. That's what I like to see, like to see now, not just here. I think um, oftentimes the non-motor symptoms, because they're so intangible, are as hard or as challenging for our patients, but also for us to be able to treat, to identify. But there are many different treatment options for all of the things that we're gonna discuss. And I'm gonna run through a few things right now. Hold on, let me get to a place where I can share my screen here. Hold on here. All right. All right, here, sharing my screen so everyone hopefully can see it. It won't shut down the infrastructure of McLean, Virginia. I'm in McLean, Virginia. Can everyone see what I'm, what I'm, what I have here? Good. All right. So the way I started last time before I shut down the infrastructure of uh, the the online world uh, somehow. I'm sorry. 
Um, I started it by by describing. I I, I present a lot about um, Parkinson's disease, and I love presenting the essay of shaking palsy uh, because what it does is it kind of helps me um, describe. If you if you understand the historical context of Parkinson's disease how it was described, when it was really described. Um, it, it shows you kind of, we are, we are in a field that has been constantly evolving since 1817. You know, the term uh, Parkinson's disease, um, it started off as an essay of shaking palsy. Now we know more and more that since 1817, we further refined our diagnosis in many cases, we don't need a tremor to diagnose Parkinson's disease. When we think about the cardinal features, we think about bradykinesia, which means slowness of movement, tremor, rigidity, postural instability, um, decreased arm swing, hypomimia, which means difficulty with movement, gesturing of the face, hypophonia, which means reduced phonation or re reduced volume, and micrographia, small handwriting. How many of you have been asked or were asked when you were diagnosed about your handwriting. Was that something that was discussed at all? Okay, good, good, okay. So it's one of our questions, you know, has your voice gotten softer? Is it harder to project? How's your sense of smell? Do you act out your dreams? How is your memory, you know? If you notice, a lot of those questions weren't about your mobility, right? And I'm gonna to talk to you about why, and then we'll get into the cognitive aspects of, of Parkinson's disease as well. So here you can see, now, what is, have you seen this before too? Kind of looks like a like an upside down Mickey Mouse, right? But just with different yeah, a coloring. Lot of, a lot of shakes of the head of nope. A lot of no's, okay, good, yes, perfect. So this is good. What we're showing you here, this is a brain and these are Lewy bodies, okay? So you've heard Lewy body. Lewy body is the protein clumping that happens within the neurons. If you see here, that substance that you're seeing is a Lewy body. And the reason it happens in many, re in many cases is because we, we lose the ability to remove the protein from the neurons. And so the protein alpha-synuclein builds up, accumulates, and leads to dysfunction of those neurons. And then we start losing those neurons. So this is called the substantia nigra. That's in the midbrain. So if you think where the midbrain is, it's right about behind, you, uh, below eye level, okay? Right behind your face, in your brain, but your, the bottom part of your brain. There are these cells that produce dopamine that are lost. And you see, see the dark substance? That's what substantia nigra means. That line is lost as we lose neurons from Parkinson's. And that's what leads to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. That's what leads to all of the motor symptoms that I told you about. Tremors, rigidity, slowness of movement. Have you heard of the substantia nigra and those dopamine producing cells before? So now you have something concrete that you can see that within the brain, you actually see that those substantia nigra neurons are lost because of that accumulation of protein in those Lewy bodies, okay? That should set kind of, for us to understand the foundation as to why things happen. Now, when, we, when it comes to the non-motor symptoms, okay, we really have to understand that the substantia nigra and the Parkinsonian motor features, the reason I have this slide is because we talk about that only being the tip of the iceberg right? You think tremors, rigidity, that is important to talk about, slowness of movement, walking, and inability, um, impairment of gait, but that is just the tip of the iceberg. Parkinson's disease is so much more than that, so much more than that. And in 2020, if we can identify the problems, identify everything that we're discussing, hopefully that will empower us to be able to communicate with our healthcare team address issues that maybe, maybe we once thought didn't necessarily have a solution, therapeutic solution. But I can tell you now as a practitioner in 2020, a lot of the things that we suffer from in Parkinson's disease can have a solution, a therapeutic solution. So we think this is the parts of the brain and the central nervous system that are affected, right? 
We talk about the pond, which is lower down. We talked about the olfactory bulb. Olfactory means olfaction or smelling. That, that nerve, cranial nerve one, is also affected in Parkinson's disease. The spinal cord, you can see the spinal cord can be affected. The peripheral nervous system, cardiac, bladder, intestinal changes. So constipation can be part of our condition because of all of the part of all of the pieces of the central nervous system that are affected. We talk about Lewy body pathology. Lewy body means those, those protein clumps, they start in the gut and they move their way up. And this is the side of the brain. It's like looking at me, I'm looking this way, okay? So you're looking at my head, but from a side view, and you see that the accumulation of protein goes up this part of the brain and then reaches the cortex. And that's how the condition progresses. And what we can see in terms of non-motor features, let's look over here. The autonomic things are constipation. How many times have you all been asked about constipation by your neurologist? Good, I'm seeing some hands up, right? Not too many. How many have not been asked about constipation? Okay, it's not too bad. So it's important whenever we think about Parkinson's disease to think about constipation. As a Parkinson's specialist, it is very important when what our goal is, our goal is to administer medications, right? Our goal is to help everybody, not just identify the problems, but come up with those therapeutic solutions. How can we offer patients therapeutic solutions if their gut isn't functioning properly? Parkinson's disease, if it starts in the gut and it moves its way up, like I mentioned, and until it reaches the brain and it affects that substantia nigra, it basically starts in the nervous system of other organs, not the brain. It starts in the GI tract, moves its way up. The heart, the nerves of the heart are affected, moves its way up, then it gets to the brain. So all of these things, can happen. Hyperhidrosis, which means some sweating, urinary or sexual dysfunction, sialuria or drooling, pain. How about pain? Has pain been addressed for, for everybody? Pain, I'm seeing more no's, some yeses. Pain is one of the most under-recognized components to Parkinson's disease. If you're stiff, and you're rigid, and we're asking you about cramps in your feet, in your legs, in your body, you can't neglect pain, right? Pain is part of that. It's not uncommon for patients to say, you know, I have a frozen shoulder and I have arthritis in, on my left shoulder on the same side where I also have my Parkinson's symptoms. There might be a relationship there, you know? If you have symptoms, neurologic symptoms of tremor and stiffness, that can also affect the joints and the joint space and lead to pain. And so we, we can't neglect it. Now, the neuropsychiatric and cognitive piece, we think about depression and anxiety. Is it common for you all to be asked about, or does your, do your, does your healthcare team inquire about depression or anxiety as much as they should? I'm seeing some yeses. How about our do we feel, is this the first time we hear about depression and anxiety as part of Parkinson's in anybody? Good. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why. But we can also see hallucinations. Parkinson's disease hallucinations can happen. Hallucinations aren't just seeing people or animals or things. You can have psychosis in many different ways. You can feel the presence of a person or a spirit or someone or something in the room. That's not a frank visual hallucination, right? Where you see people formed visual hallucinations. You can feel the presence of people. You can look straight, but in your periphery, something passes. That's called a passing hallucination. You might think it's an animal or a bird, right? Or there's something called an illusion. Have you heard of illusions before? Not in the context of magic, but in the context of Parkinson's disease. An illusion is, where something can look like something else and it can trick your mind. 
for a certain amount of time. And then so let an example is looking outside your window. A lot of the times this happens when it's dark, right? When the input, the visual input to your brain can get confused when things are dark. When things are lit up, you may not experience as many, as, as many hallucinations. But for example, you can look outside and an illusion is a tree might look like a person for a moment. Or a your mailbox might look like an animal for a second. Or a belt on the floor might look like something else. A shoe might look like a, an animal. So where you see one thing and it looks like something else and maybe you move a little bit more closely and you see that in fact, it's not an animal, it's actually something different. So these are things that we do talk about. Apathy, fatigue. How many of you have said, I feel tired. I can't put my finger on it. What is it? Am I just tired, right? What about sleep? Do you know what the most common sleep disorder is in Parkinson's disease? And that's kind of a trick question. How many of you have been asked about sleep or have seen a sleep specialist or have had a sleep study? Good job, good job. But the reason I bring it up is because sleep apnea, something as, as, as uh, prevalent as sleep apnea is very, is not uncommon in Parkinson's. Same way that you have rigid muscles because of the Parkinson's disease, you can have rigid muscles around your chest wall, which make it, makes it hard when you're sleeping to expel air. And that's what sleep apnea is. Then we have REM behavioral sleep disorder, acting out our dreams, talking in our sleep, moving, punching, kicking, sometimes falling out of bed in the middle of the night, right? And this can all be part of REM behavioral sleep disorder, the most common the most common sleep disturbance in Parkinson's disease, kind of a, 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 a trick question, is it's called sleep fragmentation. How many of you have heard of sleep fragmentation? What is that? Good job. I see Judy is hand, raising her hand. Good. I see. So, so sleep fragmentation just means, hey, you know what, doctor? I'm, it's easy for me to fall asleep. But you know what? It's not easy for me to stay asleep, right? Does that sound familiar? I might wake up many times a night, sometimes feeling restless, sometimes feeling sweaty, sometimes feeling like it's hard to turn. Maybe I experience pain in bed. What if I have some restless leg in the middle of the night? What is that? What about what's called nocturia, urinating at night? The urge to urinate. And in males, patients will say, but doctor, I went to see my urologist, my prostate, fixed it. Nothing really changed with my, my, my urination pattern at night. I'm still getting up all, all hours of night. And, and I'm telling you as a doctor, drink a lot of water, right? I say, drink a lot of water. It's good for you. It's good for your blood pressure so that your blood pressure doesn't drop because patients with Parkinson's might have low blood pressure. But then I have to urinate all the time, right? I want patients to not dislike me. I want them to come back to me. I don't want to worsen their state, right? I want patients to drink water, stay hydrated, but at the same time, not feel like they're up all night feeling more fatigued. So all of these things are part of the progression of the condition. You know, when we, this is a big graph, right? But what I'm showing you here in yellow, the yellow line means as we lose those neurons and of those dopamine neurons that I showed you in that, in that mid, mid brain, in that substantia nigra, um, what you see is that the dopamine goes down, but the other symptoms come up. So as those that dopamine level goes down, you might see more sleep disorder, more olfactory issues, more mood changes, more changes in your blood pressure, drops in blood pressure when you stand feeling lightheaded can contribute to fatigue. And then later on in the, in the diagnosis, we might see those motor symptoms that we talk about. Now, I'm going to skip some of this, but I want you to see this slide. Here, hold on. I want you to see this. Here, sorry about that, guys. I went too far. Oh, I'm sorry. I went to, meant to go back. So what happens is as the condition progresses, if you see stage five and six right here, 
that pathology of Lewy body of Lewy bodies comes up and it, it targets different parts of the brain. This middle part, this lower part, I'm sorry, it contains a lot of centers and the centers that it contains, just like we think about Parkinson's disease as a dopamine disorder, low dopamine leads to some of these symptoms. Dopamine is important for movement. It's important for mood. It makes you feel good right? Dopamine is a feel-good chemical, neurotransmitter. It's also those centers of the brain, as that those Lewy bodies affect those neurons, we have centers of serotonin. If you affect serotonin levels, that creates depression, more anxiety. If you affect serotonin, you're affecting circadian rhythm. You're contributing to those sleep abnormalities, right? Adrenaline, there's an adrenaline center also in that part of the brain. Adrenaline is important for energy. If you don't want to feel fatigue and you want to feel energetic, you need adrenaline, but we're lacking adrenaline in many cases. That's also called norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is adrenaline. The other missing piece is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is another chemical that's affected in, in Parkinson's. So I want us all to think about the disorder and not just think about it in, 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 a, in a binary way, we have to think about it as a motor and non-motor disorder. But at the same time, it's not all about dopamine. It's very much about dopamine, but it's not all about dopamine. Serotonin can be affected. Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is important for memory. It's important to reduce hallucinations. You need acetylcholine. So in order to improve cognition and, um, and psychosis, we use medicines to promote acetylcholine levels. Now I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna talk a little bit more about what it is that, that I mean. Now, if we think about the condition in terms of a dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine or adrenaline and acetylcholine disorder, not only does it allow us to understand the condition better and understand all of the chemicals that need um, to be addressed when, when, when trying to improve the disease, but it also allows us to think therapeutically, thera therapeutically driven. And this is setting the tone for the next conversation. If we can think about the condition and link some of the symptoms that we're feeling with some of the different chemicals, we call them neurotransmitters. Then those chemicals, we have so many different ways in 2020 to augment those chemicals. For example, how many of you have experienced depression or anxiety? Everybody, right? I mean, at some point in their life, everybody's going to raise their hand. If you're breathing still, you probably have. That's exactly right. Exactly right. I'm, I'm experiencing every day. I have, I'm seeing patients in the hospital. I just um, was in the ICU taking care of patients and the, the ER and um, my wife is a physician. We're both continuing to see patients, you know, during a pandemic. Um, we're taking, trying to stay connected with our patients. It's the winter months, right? We talk about the winter months. We might see a seasonal connection to anxiety and depression. We also see a, a seasonal, um, a seasonal change with psychosis. Psychosis is hallucinations, like I mentioned, but I, I didn't talk about delusions. Sometimes our patients can experience delusions, which are feeling scared that either people are doing bad things to you or that someone is in the house, for example, making mistakes and, and feeling like someone's um, doing bad things uh, in terms of financial, like stealing money. And so delusions can be part of Parkinson's sometimes and they can go under recognized unless asked. It's not uncommon for me right there in my chair. Oh, right there, this is my chair, if you can't see it. Um, I'm sitting there and I ask my patients, I say, I have a patient and a caregiver, a patient and a partner in the, in the room. It's not uncommon for me to say, do you experience any um, feelings that people are doing bad things to you? Or do you ever feel the presence or see a person or an animal in the room that might not actually be there? It's not uncommon for the patient to go like this and the partner to go like this. 
that sort of question is so important. Sometimes I'll say, have you ever experienced depression or anxiety? And the patient may do this and the partner may do this. Or sometimes we get the other, the other piece. So do you ever feel depression and anxiety? And the patient says, no, no, no. And then the partner says, what are you talking about? Yes, he is, he is or he or she is depressed. What do you, what do you mean? And so it very much, you know, our condition, Parkinson's disease is very much a, a disease that doesn't just affect our patients, but it affects our partners. It affects our family, our community. And I always say Zoom is the best way to meet, not just Zoom, right? I, now everyone's using Zoom like we use Kleenex for tissues, right? But, but what I mean is if we can continue to meet like this, now I'm seeing patients in their element. I'm meeting the partner from, from Arizona and the, 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 um, the, the cousin that lives in, in Europe. And sometimes I have 10 people on one, on one, uh, on one appointment. Um, and all of those perspectives are important. Sometimes it's hard because you know, you're adding more cooks to the kitchen, which we don't always want, but sometimes it's important. And so for our patients that feel um, that it would be beneficial for, pat for patients' family to be in the room or in the virtual room with the doctor, I always say I welcome that because I can get perspectives, not just from the patient, but also from family. Because insight sometimes, a lot of the times when I, my wife, if, if she knows, she knows me, right? My wife knows me. She'll know if I'm stressed before I maybe feel it, right? She said, you're stressed. You had a long day at work. I said, yep, you're right. How did you know? I didn't even notice until you asked me that I, I felt tired and I, I had a long day and I felt stressed. I just got home. She goes, I know you. And so that sort of kind of insight from the partner um, is important. Now, when we talk about cognition, that's even more important, right? This conversation is very much about cognition too. When we think psychosis is part of cognition, but cognition is not all memory. How many people have felt, how many people have been asked about their memory at all by their doctors or their team that takes care of them? Okay. Not a whole lot of hands up. Good. How many have not been asked? Okay. Few. Good. How many have seen a Montreal cognitive assessment before? A few. Okay. How many have not? I'm trying to scroll through. That's why I. Ken said I don't remember and the smiley face. That's true. It's like so. <laughs> that's true too. So so, I'm gonna show you a Montreal cognitive assessment. Let's see. Now we're in interactive world, interactive land here. I can show you something. Here. This is also so helpful while you're pulling that up. I'm just gonna say, it's really great to remember that the brain doesn't exist on its own. It is tied to the rest of the system. So when you talk about sleep and you talk about all of these other symptoms, you know, it's, we, those all tie to cognition too and how the brain progresses and navigates PD. So that is a really good reminder of all of that. Yes, completely. You know, when we think about um, when we think about the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, it gives us a lot, a lot of information regarding not just memory, uh, but also cognition. Um, when we think about what what cognition really is, memory is a is a large piece of cognition, but attention is also a major piece, right? When we think about attention, you know, um, our ability to concentrate, um, our ability to, to think about um, things in, a, on, in an on-demand way, right? So for example, I was just trying to finish a sentence. And as I'm trying to finish the sentence, I'm also trying to look for my Montreal Cognitive Assessment so I can show you what it is that I wanna show you here. That's called multitasking. If you ask my wife, now today's the theme about my wife, she says I can't multitask, which is very true. My job has made me have to multitask, uh, but it's true, it's very hard to multitask. That is so much 
a cognitive issue as it is an attention issue. So attention, when you're trying to focus on one thing uh, and do another thing at the, at the same time, you need to practice in order to do that. Do you see the screen? You can see my, my Montreal Cognitive Assessment, right? Good, okay, good, sorry. So here, so how many of you have not seen this? Okay, okay, okay. So what do we think? It's, uh, it's not everybody, but it's a few people. Um, there's so many people here, I'm so excited that I have to scroll through. And so that's what I'm doing when you guys answer. But, but what you see here is, it's a, it's a questionnaire out of 30, okay? 30 out of 30, but it gives us a lot of information. There's also something called the mini mental state exam, okay? Mini MMSE is another way, but in cognition, a lot of the times using the Montreal Cognitive Assessment helps us because the aspects or the components of cognition that we are addressing um, are better addressed with this than the MMSC in certain cases. So, for example, what does it mean to go, you see the letter, the, the number one and the letter A, and then the letter A and the number two. So if I ask you to please complete, complete the pattern, go from one to A and A to two, and take a pen and complete the pattern for me. And that's all the information I gave you. That takes executive function. A Parkinson's patient cognitively may be able to recall, recall events and tell wonderful stories about the past, right? Or the present. But if you ask them, what about short-term memory? Short-term memory often can be affected, right? Long-term or remote memory may not be affected. Or if I asked a patient with Parkinson's to complete a task like this one, it might be a little bit difficult. They might get it, but they might feel like it takes a little bit longer, maybe now than it did maybe 10 years ago. There might be this slowness of thinking. The processing speed might be reduced a little bit. What if I asked someone to draw a cube? Some people like me may not be artistically inclined, right? So drawing a cube um, may not have been something that they could ever do, but we test for it. We wanna see how your visual spatial capacity is. And then we ask a very important question, drawing a clock. Not like a digital clock, like in 2020, we have so many digital clocks everywhere, right? Just tells us the time. The hard part is uh, US time is easy. Army, military, or European time is really hard for me. If I ever get a sent a, like a message that we're gonna meet at, at 1600 hours, it really racks my brain, that's hard. Sometimes I'll, I'll show up at 6 p.m. Sometimes I'll show up at the right time. Sometimes I'll subtract 12 and I'll get the wrong number. But, but when we think draw a clock, like an actual clock with all the numbers in it, with the hands, with the little hand and the big hand, where it says 1110, we may have trouble, okay? That's not so much memory that's more visual spatial capacity and executive function. And so a lot of those things can be missed with other sorts of questions. So that is a, a, common, a common issue in Parkinson's disease. That one aspect, that top row um, can be affected in Parkinson's. Now, what if we asked you to name things like animals? This middle one is a little bit tricky, right? Some people might call it, I get a hippopotamus a lot. And then I have patients from other countries, they go, I've never seen that before. What do you, what, is that some sort of, I, I've, I don't know what to tell you. Or some people might tell me that this is not a camel, this is a dromedary. And to be honest, I've learned from my patients. I've even, I've had a patient tell me about the rhino. They said, well, there's black rhinos and white rhinos and the, the, the horn comes out in different ways. And I learned that Camels and dromedaries may not be exactly right. Um, the, the, the number of humps, and I forget now which one's which, but, but anyway, the point there is we ask questions about naming, and I'll move a little bit more quickly. Then we ask you to register words, which is, can you repeat the five words that I tell you? I'm going to ask you in five minutes to recall those five words, okay? Then we do some repetition. 
We ask you to count backwards from 100 by sevens. We'll ask you to repeat sentences. Fluency. We ask you to, in one minute, tell, tell us all the words you can think of that start with a letter. Okay, right here on this test, it's a letter F. But then, then, after we've confused you with all of those things, okay, we ask you to recall the five words that we asked, that we asked initially for you guys to register. And a lot of the times that can be affected. That can be affected in, as we get older, as part of normal aging, it can also be part of the normal progression of Parkinson's. That cognitive change that can happen as we get older. Um, and, and I want us all also to diagnostically, a test like this is helpful because we also ask about date, time, year, what place, city, orientation. We ask you to come up with an association between what are a train and a bicycle, for example, what do they do? Train and a bicycle, we might say wheels, right? They both have that both the train and the bicycle have wheels, but that's not what we're looking for. We want a higher level answer. What, how are they similar? What do they do? They're used for transportation, for example. So this is not an easy test by any means, right? This is a tricky test, but it helps us determine in many ways what it is that we're dealing with. Now, what are our thoughts about this? We've talked about not just the progression of the condition, not just the motor and non-motor features, not just the neuropsychiatric issues, but the other issues like pain, sleep disturbance, the changes in blood pressure. But then we talked about cognition. What are our thoughts? And I, we have a ton of I know questions. That you have a ton <laughs> of oh, questions. You all right, that's why I left a lot them. of time. I, I tend she, to talk a yes. lot. Yes. No, it's good. <laughs> I mean, one person said this is one of the most uh, what is inspired, informed, in-depth, best talk yet. So oh, there you go. Thank you. So it was worth it was worth giving me another chance after the 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 when I fell off the face of the internet. I couldn't get back on it. <laughs> we are so grateful to you for doing this series for us and for Acadia for introducing us to you to do this series for us and their their support of it. And when we get Dr. Miri and uh, the fourth one, it's going to be wonderful. So I'm going to let you it. ask questions, Anissa. I'd like to refine, we refine it more and then we continue to do this and, and we can, and, and, and I think if we do this on a regular basis and we continue to learn from each other and, and bounce off ideas from each other, stay connected, I think that would be, I would love that. Okay. Well, we have a ton of questions. I tried to, to categorize them somewhat, but they were coming pretty rapid fire. So I'm going to go back and start first with um, how, how can you slow progression of cognitive decline and, um, and then how do people communicate these changes? How do you describe some of them that maybe are a little more subjective? Um, and, you know, one person said a lot of the cognitive or even psychological impacts are really addressed head on that the clinicians often seem intimidated by the subject. So are there guidelines on, on questions or ways to communicate these things to their physicians? And, um, and what can people do to maybe slow this down, like slow some of these cognitive changes down? So I know those are multiple questions in one, but I think maybe you can address no. those as you describe that. Thank you. That was a great way to summarize. It's hard because there's so many there's so many questions, um, and and so let me I'll try and um, answer th that. Um, so the one thing I I I want to set I want to set the tone here and say you know in 2020 there are many ways to address all of the pieces and the way we've set up the series is to talk about this aspect first, but the next, the next talk is going to be about, okay, how do we address them? What, what therapies are we using? What drugs do we use to target all of these things? But the question that was summarized is very important because communication is key. And um, we've mentioned this on previous presentations before, but communication, if I can, if I can make a statement, 
one statement to you that I want everyone to take home with, with, with them or stay home with because everyone might be home um, is learn how to communicate some of these symptoms and write them down. And when you go to see your, your team, your healthcare team, read from something that was written. That's so helpful. Lists help organize and lists help our doctors and our team understand. Because in many ways we're trying, imagine you could spend, if, if, you, if you could, we might be able to spend three hours in each visit with the doctor, you know, talking about, look at all the stuff that we just talked about. I had to try and summarize it into 40 minutes. It's so hard. You can do, we do four day series of, the, of this, just motor and non-motor. We can talk about this for four days straight, presenting on all of the aspects of it. So if you can learn how to address each one of these things and mention it to the doctor and the team, I think it's important. If we're feeling depressed or anxious, or if our partner notices that we're feeling depressed or anxious, it's important to, to bring that up. It's important to bring it up. If we're feeling confused or cognitively even a little bit impaired, bringing it up and just, just having the conversation and having that sort of dialogue with the doctor and the healthcare team and say, look, I want to address certain things with you. We've last time we spoke. We talked about my son, or we talked about my mobility. And today, I'd like to talk about one of these pieces. Sometimes we, we tell patients, look, we've spent a, um, a long time today trying to tease out your motor symptom. Let's make another appointment. And you can bring that up too. Can we make another appointment to talk about some of the intangible things the things that aren't related to my movement, the things that are related to everything else that's Parkinson related, my cognition. Can we, can we meet about my memory? Can we meet about my psychiatric state? Can we meet about my sleep? I'd like to talk about my sleep or ask the doctor, is there someone else I can talk to? Do you recommend seeing a sleep specialist? If I could you know, tell each patient to go see a gastroenterologist to, to, to combat constipation, a cognitive neurologist to talk about cognition, a psychiatrist to talk about psychiatric issues, a sleep specialist, a cardiologist to talk about blood pressure, an internal medicine doctor. We've said this before, but look at all these team members that we need. And until the system develops a more patient-centered approach to care, which really doesn't exist as much as it should, it's our jobs to help guide our healthcare team down the right path, especially if we're not even screening. You know, it, a lot of um, practitioners don't ask these questions. Maybe they don't mention um, memory at all, right? But if there's a therapeutic intervention or a non-therapeutic intervention, a lot of the times, now to, to touch on the other part of the question, you know, how is it, how do we slow these things down? Okay, I can tell you. Exercise makes a difference. Mindset, mindfulness makes a huge difference. Mindfulness, being happy, reducing stress. Exercise is part of that. Healthy lifestyle, okay, in terms of diet, sleep, everything that has to do with that kind of mindfulness and lifestyle. And then don't forget, exercise the brain. Don't stop exercising the brain. Keeping your brain active. You know, you can take control of this. You can help slow decline. You can, if you read and keep reading, or if you do games like Sudoku, or if you do things like crossword puzzles, or if you continue to play, um, you know, bridge with your friends, if you do things that continuously stimulate your brain, that can be helpful. Something that we tend to prescribe a lot and a lot of the times um, patients said, oh, I didn't even know this existed. Other thing we do is, is we can prescribe an order the same way that we write for physical therapy, or I should say right now like this, because we type it and put it into the, the electronic um, sky. Um, but, but, but a lot of the times we'll prescribe cognitive therapy. What is that? Cognitive behavioral therapy? That's more psychological, right? Cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of 
um, therapy, talk therapy, and understanding our behaviors and our cognition can be done by a psychologist, social worker, psychiatrist. Cognitive therapy is very much about using brain training exercises with a certified speech language pathologist, and they can help with memory and retrieval of thoughts. Retrieval. A lot of the times patients say, it's on the tip of my tongue. It's hard for me to finish my sentence. Sometimes I lose my train of thought. It's not always about the, the memories themselves. The memories or the words are not lost. It's about retrieval of those memories that are effective in Parkinson's disease. It's that retrieval process can be slowed and effective. And so you can exercise that part of the brain. You Hopefully that answered the question. A lot of questions. All oh, right, I know I was trying. Like, I don't know how you read my mind, but apparently that must be some of your cognitive training. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have had a couple of questions. Um, and I'm going to go back to like the description of things that's going on. Sometimes it's tough to describe some of the confusion or some of the symptoms. Some physicians don't listen. And then you have those who don't have a care partner. They're, you know, their own care partner. They might be single or they just don't have that family support. So what can uh, people in those situations do to make sure that that information does get imparted to their doctor so that it can be addressed appropriately? And how can they decide, well, you know, how can they um, come out? Is this normal aging? Is it comorbidity? Or is this Park Parkinson's? So that's a great question. And, and, and really, really the way the, there's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to know, right? Um, what is part of, you know, the, the aging paradigm and what is part of the Parkinson's paradigm and what is dementia, what is cognitive impairment? And the way we, we tend to look at it, you know, is really, um, it, it's numbers, right? In many ways, we try and use data points, right? So we use methods like the mini mental state, state exam, um, the um, Montreal Cognitive Assessment, Sometimes we'll just ask a patient to draw a clock, you know, a clock has, is highly sensitive. Um, and so if it's hard to draw a clock, we might see, okay, then there might be impairment in other aspects of, of, of memory. There's also diagnostically, you know, if we're trying to understand a little bit better and we're trying to um, empower ourselves um, and not necessarily rely on the doctors or the teams that may, might not be addressing the issue, um, there are neuropsychologists, you know, you can look up neuropsychologists and make an appointment with a neuropsychologist. Those are um, specialty, specialty trained uh, um, um, uh, neuropsychologists that don't just deal with psychiatry and psychology, but also deal with cognition. They're not MDs. Oftentimes they're PhDs, but they can do an in-depth sometimes five hour analysis. It's called a neuropsychological examination. And it's not uncommon in our special Parkinsonism and dementia clinic, the one that I direct. It's not uncommon for us to, we might do our own assessment, but then we say, no, look, you know, we need more information. And sometimes it's not a bad idea to get an understanding or a baseline assessment, right? We may not necessarily have any issues um, at all, or we feel some subtle issues, but a, an in-depth neuropsychological evaluation um, can also help us kind of tease out what's part of aging, what's part of mild cognitive impairment, more severe cognitive impairment, and, and more than that, like dementia. Um, that's, some, that's a way that we, that we look, look for um, and understand um, cognition. The other things that we always check for are things like B12, right? Your B12 level is important for your cognition. Thyroid function, that's another thing. Um, some other um, um, lab values we check for, um, infection, um, and, 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 and other things like vitamin deficiencies, like B1, um, thiamine, um, and folic acid, homocysteine. There are certain things that we look for in, in the blood if we do see cognitive impairment that might be reversible. You know, there might be some features 
um, you know, B12 deficiency a lot of the times can present itself as cognitive impairment. And the other things that can present itself as cognitive impairment is psychological issues, depression. If our patients are depressed or anxious, or if there's some psychosis, some underlying psychosis, all of those things cloud our way of thinking. That's why everything we've talked about in terms of lifestyle modification, therapeutic intervention, you know, all of those things need to be addressed. But sometimes a patient will come in and they might not score so well on our Montreal Cognitive Assessment, for example. And then I find out, I ask about depression and anxiety. I find out, you know, there's a lot of depression in this patient. Sometimes we'll treat that patient for their depression and their cognition might improve. So there is something called pseudo cognitive impairment. It looks and feels like cognitive impairment, but in reality, it might just be depression. So we, it's, it's, it's a complicated field. The brain is a complicated organ. And it's so, there's so many factors at play, um, but, but it, th that's why it's important to address cognition in so many ways. So I know we're running out of time, but I would love to, if you could comment, because I've had a couple of comments that's come through. What do you do in a situation if you have um, maybe a person with Parkinson's who doesn't necessarily agree with what the spouse is seeing in sharing with the physician and often will contradict or kind of make up excuses or reasons for certain behaviors. How, how do people navigate that? And it, it's hard. It's hard because, so, you know, our goal first is to not insert, I, as, as a healthcare provider, I, I don't want to insert any sort of tension between our, our patients and our partners or family members. Um, but I tend to educate as much as I can, you know? And I tell them exactly what I told everyone here, you know, that it's not uncommon for there to be differing opinions about what's going on. But we have to welcome those differing opinions. We have to have, just like you have to have the conversation with your healthcare team and you have to write things down, or prepare for your appointments, same way that you prepare, you have your, your, your things that you do after your appointments, like the medication reconciliation that we talked about at the last, at the last uh, presentation. Preparing for appointments, both the caregiver or the spouse or the, the, the niece or nephew or the mom or the dad, preparing and presenting to the doctor or the healthcare team and kind of keeping the forum open for all sorts of um, opinions is very important because it's true. You know, we might have that differing, those differing opinions. We might have a patient who does not necessarily feel that they are depressed. And it's, and it's not, it happens in my family, you know, with my family members, I'll tell them, look, I feel like you're anxious. You know, this is a tough time. And they might say, no, I'm not anxious but everyone else might feel that they're anxious, you know? And during the holidays, they might, we might all sit, not, not right now, but pre-coronavirus, pre we might all sit at a table and um, we might have someone that has some anxiety and, and the others feel it, but the person themselves may not feel it. On the other hand, it might be, it might be wrong. It might be wrong that, um, you know, if, if there is a, a spouse that feels that the patient is feeling a certain way, we cannot neglect um, you know, how the, the spouse might be feeling. Because another big piece here is not just the, the patient, the effect on the patient, but we can't underestimate the, the effect on everybody that loves the patient, right? And, and going through it also as a partner or a spouse or a family member is hard. And, um, and, and we, we can't also neglect that piece. A lot of the times I'll ask, you know, the caregiver or partner, how are you feeling? How do you feel? You know, and 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 I'll ask them if they've um, been able to seek, you know, uh, medical help for some of the experiences that they're feeling. If they're feeling anxious, depressed, if they're tired, um, you know. So so it really is. It really is hard. It does take a village um, to take care of our patients, and and we have to do things like this. You know. I love partnering with the PMBA to continue to talk and, 
and, and, and have these conversations because if everyone here is coming together and I love the, the, the phrase empowered, right? We have the empowered tool and everything. If everyone here is empowering themselves by learning and coming together, and this is a forum in and of itself, you know, just like when our patients come into our clinic room, this is a forum for discussion. This is, we're trying to get us to a better place. That's what this is to me, you know, how is it that all of us together, we're congregating virtually, um, and how do we congregate to move the field uh, in, in the right direction as patients? And, and then patients help the field and that practitioners move in the right direction too. This is a relatively new field in 1817. That's not that long ago. I know it is it, pre-corona feels like such a long time ago. 1817 was a, was a long time ago, but movement disorders is a new field relative to other fields. And so we're learned from, we, we need to learn from our patients, you know? We need to figure out, you know, what's important. And, and a lot of the times, if, if we're not in an area where we have a big center that takes care of Parkinson's disease, and maybe there are a lot of patients that, that see internists for their Parkinson's disease care, they might not even see neurologists, help that, that internist, help them, help that, P, that, P, that PDP, that PCP or the PMD, uh, PMD, not PMD Alliance, but the, but the, the, the primary practitioner, help them, guide them, say, I learned something at the PMDA presentation or anything that you've empowered yourself with. I learned that cognition is a part of Parkinson. Can you help me figure out if I have some cognitive impairment? Can you help me see a psychiatrist? Can you help me? Um, I heard about a speech therapist that can do cognitive therapy. That sounds cool to me. Can you help me get there? You know, and that's really what what this is an advocacy group like the PMD Alliance. They, they help us. Resources are important. So I have a lot to say, um, and we just had one hour, but um, and I was late by a couple minutes. So <laughs> so that you could do this over like a series, like more hours, <laughs> like like ten hours, we could do. Yeah. I know, but you, it's it's wonderful. And actually, somebody said. Um, somebody said, oh, we need more time for this. And that's the thing. I think these things are complicated. And I just think you, you put it so well. And what struck me as I was listening to you talk is, you know, it's, we have to remember, and it's hard because we're in, the, we're, in, we're in the panic and worry or fear or grief place of trying to figure out what's going on. It can feel really like I got to get on this right away. And if we can keep remembering that this, this disease is really a marathon, it's not a sprint. And so if we miss it today, we can check it out tomorrow. And we just keep, keep plugging along with it because it really is, it is that process and collaboration. And, you know, I think I can't agree more with the people who have said your patients must love you, cannot agree more <laughs> with that. Um, and having a doctor where you feel like you can have these conversations is really important um, because if you have a doctor that you don't feel you can actually talk about this stuff with, you're never going to go there. And that's, that's sad for everybody. Um, because we are all going to deal with cognitive issues, like it or not. Uh, Parkinson's might just speed that up and bring some unique challenges. But um, I'm so grateful for the time that you have shared with us today and the um, engagement. Um, it, is, it, is, it is helpful. It is comforting to know that there's someone with you. It's comforting to know that there's someone that cares. Um, there are some treatments once doctors can understand. Uh, you gave a lot of really great language today to help understand things, to help start to refine. Um, we are, this will be on our YouTube channel. We will be following up with sending out an email to you. There were a lot of questions. So we will send an email to everyone that registered that will have the link to the landing page, which will also have the Empowered tool, which has a really great symptoms tracker for a year. It also has the whole ecosystem. So you can think about what other doctors and providers do you need in your, in your care team. Um, it has the medication tool that Dr. Torres Yagi put together for us, and it has registration for the whole series. So we'll make sure you get all of that information. Um, this is, you know, we're better in this because we are all in this together. And um, I can't wait to run the report and see how many states and probably countries we are, but how many, uh, how far we're reaching. We can't thank you enough, Dr. Torres Yagi, for your time, 
um, Acadia and the team and every single one of you for being here. Uh, it is always a pleasure and joy to see you. And I love when I get to see facial expressions and hands raised. And um, if everybody would give their greatest gratitude of thanks and wave to Dr. Torres Yagi, um, I'll give you a virtual scroll. hug. Uh, oh, so nice. Look at those. Hug, everybody hug. Yeah, I know we do like our virtual hugs now, you know, we have right? to. <laughs> Depending on how close you are to the person is how close you get to the camera. But um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Really appreciate it. Can't wait to see you guys again soon. And thank you, Dr. Torres Yagi. My pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye.